Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the AME Food Testing Show. Today's topic, a primer on molecular epidemiology with Dr. Stephen Cannabell, Professor, Food Science, College of Agricultural Sciences, Penn State University, University Park, Pennsylvania. Dr. Cannabell received his doctoral degree from Iowa State University in microbiology and food technology, also his master's degree and his bachelor's degree from Iowa State. Dr. Cannabell has published over 100 studies in academic journals, including detection, tracking, and control of foodborne pathogens, listeria, monotitogenes, E. coli, 0157H7, salmonella, Campylobacter. He's also developed a novel method or multiple methods for the recovery of injured foodborne pathogens and detection by conventional and molecular methods. He studied contamination of raw animal foods by gram-negative foodborne pathogens and destruction by high pH. His understanding and enhancement of the mechanisms of action of food grain microbial inhibitors is also well published. He's worked in metal ion interactions with spoilage and pathogenic microorganisms. He's also studied the role of heat shock in proteins and induced thermal tolerance. His research also includes the long-term survival phase of listeria and its effect on changes in barotolerance, thermal tolerance, and cellular morphology. Now, welcome me, uh, help me welcome Dr. Cannabell at this time. Steve? Hi, Andy. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be with you. Would you like to add anything else to your introduction? No, I think we've covered that pretty well. Wonderful. Today's topic is fascinating to me. I work in this area every day, helping food producers, food quality, food safety, and food security managers in their assignments and understanding the complex world of the germ theory. Today's topic, molecular epidemiology, is particularly interesting. Let's begin with a broad brush introduction of what is a bacterial pathogen? Well, I guess to answer that question, I'd have to break it down into the two words you have there, bacterial. So uh, bacteria is a invisible single-celled microorganism that are pretty much everywhere in nature. And uh, <clears throat> the last one is uh, a pathogen, and that's something that causes disease. Now, when it comes to bacteria, there's many different kinds. I like to break them down into three categories, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good ones being ones that uh, are good for us, ones that uh, help get rid of our waste and recycle nutrients and also are used to as starter cultures to make cheese and beer and wine, things we like. And uh, also probiotic bacteria that give us a uh, healthy intestinal tract and, and promote health and wellness. Then the ugly ones, that would be the ones that cause spoilage, and even though they make things look disgusting and smell disgusting, they themselves are not harmful. And then lastly are the pathogens, the ones that cause disease, these typically don't cause any changes to the food, but yet they can make you very sick. So the bacterial uh, pathogen would be these single-celled microorganisms that you can't see that cause disease. Fascinating. So we can't see them. We can't smell them. What technologies do we use to detect them? Well, uh, this is a kind of a historical thing. When when we first started detecting pathogens, we would use what are called cultural methods, where you'd actually grow them in the laboratory so they'd have to reproduce in some type of media. And then after that, we moved on to more sophisticated biochemical tests, where you would see what kind of uh, products and enzyme reactions the microorganisms would carry out. And then uh, we moved into kind of the DNA era where we were looking at the DNA within the microorganisms, the actual hereditary material, and then using that to specifically detect 
uh, different pathogens. But uh, I have to stop here and say that uh, detection is usually just to a certain level. It's uh, we lo looking at the genus or the species of an organism, so it doesn't get down to the strain level. So that's kind of uh, important to know about detection. The other thing that's important to know about detection is that most microorganism pathogens, when they're in food, they're, it's kind of like a needle in the haystack type of situation where you have just a a few pathogens that are present in a fairly large food sample. And sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not type of thing because they're kind of uh, hit and miss of whether the contamination occurs. So it makes it very challenging for detecting uh, bacterial pathogens in foods because uh, if they are there, they're going to be in very low levels. And usually the other organisms that are there that are not pathogens are much higher levels. So the detection part becomes very tricky, uh, so we have to use what we're called selective media to uh, amplify up the pathogen growth and then detect that growth either by plating it on uh, specific media that allows us to see the colonies, but then also we, we can use methods like PCR, to, which is called polymerase chain reaction, which amplifies up specific genes very rapidly. And so we can target specific genes that are specific to different genus like uh, Salmonella or different species like Listeria monocytogenes to tell us whether or not uh, those pathogens are indeed present or not. Excellent review of the broad spectrum of tools that traditional microbiologists employ. Now, you are a researcher your particular specialty is in molecular epidemiology. How is that different than detection? So molecular epidemiology, and again, you have to break the thing down into two words. Molecular typically means you're focusing on the DNA, and epidemiology is the study of disease within populations of people. So now we're not talking about food per se. We're talking about the... Uh, whole population of people. And we're not talking about disease within within one person. We're talking about disease spreading amongst many people. So to, to get at that, we have to get down to the strain level. This is different than detection where you normally don't get down to the strain level. You're just at the genus or species or at most serotype level. <clears throat> so how do we get down to the strain level that we have to target uh, things within the bacterial cell, uh, usually with the DNA-based methods that can get down to the strain level. <clears throat> and one of the best things that we can use are, are DNA sequence in order to do that. That technology is very new. I would venture to say that for a majority of our listening audience, again, food production, food quality, food safety, and food security managers, this entire concept of molecular epidemiology or going down, as you said, down to the genus, species, and strain level is something relatively new. Wouldn't you agree in your research? Yes, uh, but it is becoming more popular. I think when you see uh, TV shows like uh, CSI on TV, and they're often talking about if you, they, they can only get the DNA, then they can run their specific DNA tests to determine who committed the crime, you know. So that's they're getting down to the individual level, which is essentially the strain level. And that's basically what we're doing in uh, with molecular epidemiology also. We want to know which specific strain is committing this crime of causing this epidemic or outbreak. And so it's, it's very analogous to that. So I think people are becoming more aware of the power of DNA. And... Uh, but there are two different, uh, as things have evolved, different types of technologies that have come along in terms of DNA-based testing. And the, the first one that came out I would call DNA fingerprinting. That's where we're looking at fragments of DNA, not, not the sequence. So one of the main <clears throat> methods that was developed and has still being used very widely is called post-field gel electrophoresis which basically uh, cuts the chromosome of, of uh, different bacteria 
into different fragments. And then when we run that out on what's called a gel electrophoresis, we end up getting a banding pattern. And that banding pattern is analogous to uh, the barcode that you see in the supermarket on all the food. So that barcode uh, is specific to that type of food, and the same thing happens with pulse field gel electrophoresis. The banding patterns that are generated uh, are usually specific to the strain. And so uh, this is be being applied uh, to many different uh, pathogens, and especially foodborne pathogens, in order to identify the outbreak strain and track it back to its source. Having said that, there there are limits uh, and limitations to uh, these DNA fragment-based methods, I'll call them, <clears throat> which include PFG or pulse field gel electrophoresis. And some of the limits are if you have these fragments, you don't really know what they mean. And the way I like the, the analogy here is if you had a book that just had a bunch of lines in it instead of words, then you wouldn't really know what that book was telling you. So, But if you have the actual letters, uh, then it, the words become obvious and you can read the book. So the same thing happens in in uh, with molecular epidemiology. The, the focus now is more and more on DNA sequencing. And basically there's four bases in DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, and the combination of those which can be infinite, tells us what that organism is. And so it's just like when, it, when you have a book uh, that has a, an alphabet, 26-letter alphabet, you can make all sorts of arrangements of books with totally different meanings. The same thing can happen with, with these H, T's, G's, and C's that can line up in all sorts of different ways and create all sorts of different microorganisms. So right now we're learning how to read the uh, the book of the bacteria, so to speak, with the book being the chromosome. And within a chromosome of a bacterium, there might be three to six million bases. And so that allows us to read the book of bacteria and to focus in on those key things that tell us, is this a dangerous organism and is it liable to spread? Well, let's review for a minute. The pulse field gel electrophoresis is the tool that is primarily used by the government, isn't it, in a food outbreak? Yes, it is. Uh, having said that, they are looking at more sequence-based methods also to complement the pulse field gel electrophoresis because they realize that there are these limitations with pulse fields. Either sometimes they get too many uh, different patterns and sometimes they get too few. So <clears throat> they're starting to move towards sequence-based methods right now to complement the PFG, and in the future it, they might totally supplant uh, the fragment-based methods and eventually might end up with just a sequence-based molecular subtyping system. So that governmental system has been known as the PulseNet, and they keep... A computer library of their findings throughout all of their That's studies. Right. Yes. I was actually at CDC once and got to see their facilities, and they actually had a separate computer and a person working at each separate computer on with every pathogen had its own separate person and computer. It was quite interesting. And they received these pulse field patterns from all the state health labs, so they all come to the CDC, and that's where they do the comparisons. And if they start seeing a common patterns coming from one or more different states, they suspect there might be a outbreak, a multi-state outbreak happening. And then they start uh, looking at that in more in depth to see if they can't detect an outbreak. And this kind of brings up another issue is that prior to these DNA-based methods, uh, a lot of the outbreaks went undetected. They were called hidden outbreaks. And the reason for that is uh, we have, our food processing system now is very large. We have huge food processing companies that are shipping products all over the country or all over the world. 
And what would happen is they would have a few cases in this state and five cases in that state, and they would go undetected. But now, because they're running this, these DNA uh, fingerprints and DNA sequence, we're able to pick up these previously hidden outbreaks. And that's one of the powers of a DNA-based approach. We're able to now see these hidden outbreaks for the first time and detect them and see that they're just really being, they're widespread, but we're only getting a few cases sometimes in each state. Well, Dr. Canabo, it's a very fascinating discussion that you've given us on the PulseNet organization. And it's not just in the United States now either. We now have PulseNet Latin America, PulseNet Europe, PulseNet Asia. So it's definitely a spreading around the world, which then allows us to compare these different uh, DNA fing fingerprints from one country to another. So it's a very powerful thing, and also the in increase in computer power. So all these things are coming together to create this PulseNet system. But uh, as I said, the, the DNA sequencing is coming on now. And another thing that's driving DNA sequencing is there's so many... Uh, whole genome sequences now that are now available for the various pathogens. And many times there's multiple uh, whole genome sequences on just <clears throat> individual pathogens. So the, the era of whole genome sequencing has really increased our information content when it comes to DNA sequence. And so we have a huge opportunity to mine, essentially mine this data and find the right markers that will detect these epidemic clones and outbreak clones. So I might want to stop here and kind of define what I mean by an outbreak and an epidemic. So outbreak is something that's localized in time and space. So typically, you you know, you have an outbreak that occurs within a couple months, and then it it's due to some specific food vehicle, and then it resolves itself. <clears throat> an epidemic is something where it transmits over a much longer period of time and space. So these things can uh, transmit for years and uh, go through many different countries. And <clears throat> so one thing we're trying to do in my lab is detect both the what we call epidemic clones and also detect the outbreak clones within the epidemic clones. <clears throat> so we have different targets that we go after that will allow us to detect these different um, subsets, if you will. Well, Dr. Cannabell, our discussion today mirrors a interview that I gave earlier this week with Elliot Olson, a lawyer in Minnesota, and he identified Holtzfield gelatophoresis as a way for the government to generally identify which pathogen a food producer ha allegedly has generated. At the same time, he said in, in our discussion that multivariance locus sequence typing, or MVLST, is a further defining technology, which I believe we're talking about, which can exonerate a food producer. Can you outline that for our audience? Yes, yeah, so kind of to start here, uh, my lab takes a somewhat of a different approach with uh, to molecular subtyping or molecular epidemiology, we try to figure out ahead of time which genes or markers within a bacterium make that organism either epi uh, to cause an epidemic. And then we specifically go after those genes. Rather than uh, with PFG, you just take a restriction enzyme that cuts the chromosome and you you throw it at the the chromosome and see what happens, basically. Uh, so that the, the the cutting sites themselves would have no relevance to making an organism an epidemic one. So that's the kind of the problem with many of these methods is that they don't really uh, try to identify genes that are causing the epidemic or causing the outbreak. So <clears throat> we started off looking at virulence genes originally just to get better discrimination, but we found out is that the virulence genes very accurately coincide 
with the the epidemic nature of the organism, and we call that uh, agreement between the molecular data and the conventional uh, epidemiology data epidemiologic concordance. So how well do those two agree is really important because whether you're talking about CDC or food companies or anybody, we want the molecular data to agree with the conventional epidemiology. By conventional, I mean in the case of foodborne illness, the, in conventional epidemiology, you ask people what they ate. And with, an, with the idea, if you ask the sick people what they ate and you ask these control or healthy people what they ate, the, the sick people should identify more with the food that caused them to become ill. So that's how we typically do conventional epidemiology. But when the two agree, when the, when the we have identified the food by both conventional epidemiology and by molecular epidemiology, that provides very strong evidence that it was that specific food and even that specific food processing plant that caused the problem. So uh, one thing we asked is why do virulence genes provide such high epidemiologic concordance? Well, number one, they cause virulence. They cause the actual disease. And number two, we think that they might actually be involved in transmission because if the person gets sick and the person actually transmits the disease to another person or to another location, then you could conceptualize these virulence genes as having two properties, both the ability to cause disease and the ability to help in transmitting the disease. And when you're talking about epidemics, Transmission is a key element here because if it doesn't transmit, you don't have an epidemic. It has to transmit and so multiple people can get ill in order to be an epidemic clone. So that's the epidemic clone part of it, which we've applied now to many other pathogens, and it seems to hold up pretty nicely that the virulence genes identify these epidemic clones, which are known to spread widely throughout a country or throughout the world. <clears throat> the other aspect, uh, the one thing that virulence genes can't tell you is if there's an outbreak clone within, and when I say clone, this is an important concept in, in ep molecular epidemiology because you have to realize when bacteria divide in half, essentially they're cloning themselves. So bacteria are naturally clonal because they reproduce by dividing in half. And this allows us then to track a clone from a patient to a food to the food processing environment because the clones don't change very much because the bacteria are just reproducing or dividing as they go through the different stages of the food system. So this clonal concept is an important one in molecular epidemiology and allows us to trace these epidemic clones back to their source or the outbreak clones back to their source. Now, getting to outbreak clones, there are epidemic clones that cause multiple outbreaks at different countries, at different times, and different foods, but we can't separate those with virulence gene sequences because they're all the same. So we tried to identify other targets within bacteria that would allow us to differentiate these different outbreak clones within the same epidemic clone. And we stumbled on these uh, bacteriophage-related genes that are in bacteria. And these, what happens is phage genes, these are from viruses, so People have viruses, bacteria have viruses too, so when they're, they attack bacteria, we call them bacteriophages or bacterial viruses. And sometimes they'll insert their viral DNA into the bacterial chromosome. And we found out these, these viral DNAs in the bacterial chromosome are hypervariable. And this allows us now to separate the outbreak clones within the epidemic clones of many pathogens. 
hope I didn't get too technical. Well, Dr. Cannabell, your research could be very helpful for a company that has been implicated using cult seal gel atrophrasis, but then can be exonerated using multiviral antilocus sequence typing. Is that correct? Yes, but it's a, it's a two-edged sword. Sometimes it could exonerate you, but sometimes it could implicate you. So, uh, But it does get at, I think, the true nature of these uh, these epidemic clones, and so we can actually detect the epidemic clone where, whereas something like PFG often cannot do that because it's a fragment-based method. It's not a sequence-based method. So you just get so much more information out of sequence data than you do out of fragments. But you have to realize that the, the this chromosome, which can, be, again, be, be between 3 and 6 million bases in size in many foodborne pathogens, it's going to have uh, a lot of noise in it because bacteria do many other things besides cause disease. So there's genes that are involved in all sorts of things that have nothing to do with the epidemic nature of the organism. The trick is to identify those genes that are causing the epidemic nature and then amplify and sequence those specific genes. So... <clears throat> We think we have a system now that's sequence-based where we can detect very accurately both the epidemic clones and the outbreak clones. And it's it's in many ways superior to pulse field gel electrophoresis. One advantage of pulse field is that you can apply it routinely pretty much to any pathogen uh, pretty fairly easily, uh, whereas with the sequence-based approach, you have to know the sequence that you're going after. So this is where the whole genome sequencing comes in, the more whole genome sequences we have, the more we can target our sequence-based methods to go after these really good markers. <clears throat> well, Dr. Cannabell, you've done quite a bit of work with hysteria. Could you review mm -hmm. that with our audience? Yeah, as I was kind of mentioning before, we started off where we wanted to get more discriminatory power. That's the reason we initially chose virulence genes. Before that, people were using what are called housekeeping genes. These are genes that are found in all bacteria, and they do basic functions in all bacteria. So that approach was called multi-locus sequence typing, but it wasn't highly discriminatory. So my first student working on this, uh, develop this multivirulence locus sequence typing in order to get more discrimination of our strains in our collection. But uh, then my next student, when he applied the MVLST to these epidemic clones, he was able to show that the epidemic clones have are identical in their virulence gene sequences within each epidemic clone, but between the epidemic clones they vary. So that we realized that we had a very good uh, marker virulence genes for these epidemic clones if we just would sequence them. <clears throat> and then, uh, as I said, the next step, we had to separate the outbreak clones within the epidemic clones. And so I had some students that kind of stumbled on these uh, this prophage in Listeria. It's called the COMK prophage. And uh, the more I studied about prophages, the more it became very interesting that many of them are what are called defective. In other words, they they really don't, they're not phages anymore. And what's, I think, becoming more obvious is that bacteria are now taking over uh, some of these prophages for their own purpose. And uh, it's getting very interesting about how these prophages allow very rapid evolution in bacteria. And so this is what allows us to see the different outbreak clones because these prophages uh, are so variable in sequence. <clears throat> so the, that's where we sit with the... So everything works so well in the case of Listeria monophytogenes because we're able to very accurately detect the epidemic clones and the outbreak clones. And then there are outbreak clones that are not part of epidemic clones, and we can detect those just with MVLST. We don't need them prophages. 
So everything was working out so well. With Siri, we started applying it to some other pathogens. We applied it to salmonella. But in salmonella, we needed some other type of phage genes, and these are called uh, CRISPRs. That's why I've been working with Dr. Dudley in our department to sequence these what are called CRISPRs, and basically they're little phage pieces of phage that the bacteria put into their genome, they're like little freight trains of phage uh, fragments, which makes them immune to that phage. So it's like the immune system for bacteria now. They, they're finding this uh, CRISPR system is very interesting. But it's also very variable because these phage uh, sequences are so hyper-variable. So we're using a combination of virulence genes and CRISPRs for salmonella, <clears throat> working very well. And now, and we did that project with CDC on salmonella. So we applied that to the top 10 zero uh, types of uh, salmonella. It worked very nicely. And uh, we, then our next thing we applied it to was MRSA. This is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And we just uh, published a paper on that very recently. And it seems to work very nicely on MRSA also, the combination of the virulence genes. But now instead of these phase genes, we've uh, sequenced this other mobile genetic element called the the MEC element, <clears throat> the one that carries the methicillin resistance. And that gives us very nice results and good concordance with the epidemiology. Can I interrupt here for a second, sure. Steve? In my former position, I worked for a company called Cepheid, and we had a extremely rapid det detection technology using DNA. One thing that I learned, I'd like you to confirm this, that each hospital that has an MRSA outbreak can identify to the substrain level that particular MRSA organism and how they evolve in each hospital. Your technology could be particularly helpful for distinguishing an MRSA strain, for example, from one hospital as a patient's transferred to another. And that's what one thing hospitals like to do is exonerate themselves by saying, hey, he didn't get it here, he got it at another facility. Right. Would you right. agree? Well, I think our method does have this uh, potential. It's not been applied yet other than to some of the strains we've gotten from Hershey Medical Center. But I, I would love to see it applied to some other hospitals. I don't think it's ever it has gotten out yet. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of hospitals just detect MRSA per se. They don't try to do the molecular epidemiology. So they basically they want to know, it, does the person have MRSA? And then they have a certain treatment. Then they might go so far as to find out what antibiotics is it uh, sensitive to or resistant to. But tip the, typically, I don't think most hospitals do this molecular epidemiology, although they certainly are interested in epidemiology because they want to prevent these MRSA infections, which are uh, increasingly uh, devastating in, to patients in hospitals. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I think these, as these approaches get cheaper and easier, and DNA sequence, the other thing is DNA sequencing is becoming so inexpensive and easy to do. So it's, it's not like it's becoming harder. It's definitely becoming easier and cheaper. And uh, as new automated technology comes out that takes advantage of this, you'll, you'll probably be able to do on a countertop with something the size of a telephone everything you want to do. So it's, uh, it's amazing what electronics and computers and molecular biology, when they start fusing together, you come out with some very powerful tools that can then be applied to track pathogens as well as prevent them from transmitting. Well, Dr. Cannabell, your work in Listeria and Salmonella will be a welcome call and an, an asset for the entire food production industry should your technology become more available as a research tool. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, and it's just a matter of a company there's many companies out there that are in the business of developing new t detection and subtyping technologies that gets picked up by one of those companies and gets commercialized. 
I'm not in the business of commercializing the things. I, I'm in the academic business and research business. So hopefully some company out there will say, hey, maybe we can commercialize this. Uh, I think it certainly has a lot of potential. And it's certainly the whole sequence-based approach is uh, there's no turning back from that. It's, there's so much power there, and uh, it's only going to get better and better. Good, Dr. Cannaville. Let's allow you to sum up our discussion today, primarily reviewing in a few words what is a bacterial pathogen, which technologies have been employed, what's molecular epidemiology, and what does your work produce to support both people that have gotten sick, people that have produced food, and people that resolve all those issues. Okay. So, first of all, the bacterial pathogens, again, are invisible, single-celled microorganisms that are everywhere, and it's only a certain subset that are pathogens. And then there's a subset of those that are foodborne pathogens. So... Uh, <clears throat> Because of the obvious problems they cause, we want to focus in on those. And one of the first things we want to do is detect them. And basically, we're detecting them at the genus level, like Salmonella, or the species level, Listeria monocytogenes, and maybe the serotype level, like E. coli 015787. One thing I didn't cover here, though, I should say, is that well, I think food safety experts have agreed that we cannot test safety into a food product. That has to be built into our food safety systems like HACCP. So the proper role of testing, whether it's uh, detection or molecular epidemiology, is to prevent these things from happening, prevent contamination, prevent the transmission of disease. And I think we should always keep that in mind. I think uh, CDC has purposely changed the name of their agency to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for that reason. They realize that the real goal of all of us in industry and academia and government should be in prevention. And that's where the I think the molecular epidemiology comes in, is that we can see how they're being transmitted. We can stop them from being transmitted. And I think that's the and when you use molecular epidemiology, you put on a different set of glasses that allows you to see the actual strains and how they're transmitting, and that's the power of that. I mentioned the clone concept is critical in epidemiology because it allows us to track these outbreak clones and epidemic clones back to their sources and thus reveal their routes of transmission again so we can stop the transmission from occurring. <clears throat> And in terms of a food processor, they would want to know that in their own food processing plant, how are these uh, dangerous strains being transmitted from one surface to another and finally ending up on the food so that once we know that route of transmission, we can stop it from happening. <clears throat> I mentioned that DNA sequences uh, provide a new and powerful tool for tracking and controlling outbreak clones and epidemic clones, and it's, again, this uh, if you just know the alphabet and you know the 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 word that's there or the the gene that's there, you can target that and know very accurately what you have on your hands. So it has so much more information in that sequence than we have in the fragments. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned that molecular and conventional uh, epidemiology should agree. That's very important. That's CDC says this is very important. They usually don't want to make a decision unless both their conventional epi and their molecular epi are saying that, yes, that food from that plant caused that outbreak. So it's very important that our we target genes in these pathogens that have a relevance to the epidemiology, that are these genes are actually causing the organism to be epidemic. And that's where we focused on these virulence genes and actually also these these phage genes that are in bacteria that are playing some role in allowing the bacterium, for example, to colonize uh, a, pr a food processing plant. <clears throat> and we think that the 
some of these phase genes might be involved in biofilm formation. And if that's the case, then that could be why they're, you know, colonizing a plant and they're transmitting because they're able to form these biofilms. <clears throat> uh, finally, just understanding the sources of the epidemic clones and outbreak clones and how they transmit around the world and within processing plants or between states, within states, that will allow us to implement more targeted. I think target is a key word here. We, a lot of times we take a shotgun approach. If we have a problem, we come in and start shooting everywhere rather than knowing exactly where the problem is coming from. And that's the power, I think, of molecular epidemiology. We can trace backwards to the actual uh, reservoir or source of the problem and then eliminate that and thus eliminate the problem. <clears throat> And I'll differentiate here between reservoir and source. So the reservoir is where they're actively growing. And so that's really what we want to eliminate because in some cases there are pathogens that, for example, get down inside slicers in a meat plant and they're growing down in there and people are not getting at that area and cleaning it. And so the, the, the stereo or some other bacteria gets in there where that food is located and it grows to very high levels, maybe billions or trillions of cells, and then it spreads from there. So if we can identify those reservoirs and eliminate them, then they can't spread to other places and contaminate the food. <clears throat> Dr. Canvo, can I interrupt here? Sure. I had a small college professor chat with me once, and he said, Andy, I'm aware that food managers should do any environmental testing because if you go looking for it, you're just going to find it. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment yeah, on that, Mark? There's two different schools on this, you know, the, and I think a lot of it's being driven by lawyers who are telling companies don't sample because you don't want to know if you have it. I don't agree with that. I think if you have a problem, you want to know it. You want to deal with it. A lot of companies, in the case of Listeria, they're just using Listeria species as an indicator of the possible presence of Listeria monocytogenes, so they're technically not detecting Listeria monocytogenes, they're detecting Listeria species, which can be like six or seven different species of Listeria. So, <clears throat> but personally, I want to know where if I do I have a Listeria monocytogenes problem? If so, I want to deal with that problem. That's that's me personally. So uh, <clears throat> the problem with the indicator thing is may it may not indicate the possible presence of the pathogen. Uh, some data I've seen is in, indicates that if you find some Listeria species that's not Listeria, there's a good chance you won't, or not Listeria monocytogenes, it's a good chance if not, you won't find Listeria monocytogenes because the other ones outcompete the monocytogenes. So it's, uh, I think it's good uh, to target not only the pathogen, but the strain of the pathogen because not all strains are equally uh, dangerous. In the case of Listeria monocytogenes, there's 13 serotypes, but only three serotypes cause 99% of the foodborne illness. So, you know, want to know, do you have one of these dangerous strains and where is it located? And you don't want it getting on the food. Again, both of these approaches, whether it's detection or molecular epidemiology, should be done for the purpose of prevention. That should be all our goal, whether there were in industry, academia, or government. Uh, I think that's, if any, we've learned anything in the last 100 years. we learned that we can't test safety into food products. That has to be built into the actual critical control points. We have to get those under control and make sure we're not getting any contamination after our cooking operation. That's an excellent summary of what I, and in complete concordance with, is that food managers, food safety, food quality managers, and food security managers need to have a constant surveillance program of both their environmental and the product. Mm -hmm. Can you 
uh, outline any of your other research that applies directly to these ideas of food safety. One uh, one interesting thing we found was this in this long-term survival phase of Listeria monocytogenes that they'll form these cocci and essentially we think go into a, like a dormant state. And so this could explain why uh, it's very difficult to get rid of uh, a specific strain of Listeria monocytogenes once it gets into a food processing plant. If you combine that with biofilm formation, now you have a biofilm with these cocci inside the biofilm, and so you can envision that they're going to essentially survive very long periods of time, maybe maybe hundreds of years. We don't know. All we know is they, <laughs> they're not dying after a year in our laboratory. They're just stationary. So it's very interesting. It's like the fifth phase of the growth curve, we we know that there's lag log stationary decline. This is like the fifth phase that more attention needs to be paid to, and you realize how uh, survival-minded bacteria really are. You know, and uh, the more I work with them, the more I'm impressed with the mechanisms they have for survival and transmission. It's a fascinating concept. I've spoken with many sanitation managers in food plants, and their philosophy is that these foodborne pathogens are like ping pong balls. They chase them all around the plant. They don't just check the same sites. They look around because these organisms have a tendency of migrating, hiding, and like you said, they're very intelligent, and they are a formidable opponent. Whenever I walk into a food processing plant, I think of four things that microbes need. They need food, they need water, they need time, and temperature. So in order to fight these microorganisms, you have to think like one. So if I'm a microorganism inside a food processing plant, where am I going to find these conditions? It's usually in the hard-to-clean areas where some food has gotten in there, some water's gotten in. You're cleaning and sanitizing, but it's not getting rid of the food or the water in that little niche. That's usually where the problems lie. And I think the outbreak in, that happened in Canada, the 2008 listeria outbreak, where they found the listeria deep inside the slicers, I think is a classic example where the, the food and the water got down in the, deep into the slicer, so deep they couldn't clean and sanitize it. Listeria got down in there started growing, maybe produced a biofilm, I don't know. And then when they turned it on, out came the listeria, you know. This, uh, these are the types of scenarios that can really create havoc, even in the best of plants. So you always have to be on guard and asking questions, you know, if I was a microorganism, where, where, would, I, where would I be? How would I get in, into the finished product? <clears throat> I have a question for you, Dr. Cannabell. It's mm-hmm. been alleged that the stereo primarily can survive in very cold environments. Most food plants, I've asked managers, why do you have the plant cold? They said it's to kill the microorganisms. And I have to kind of <laughs> chuckle when I hear that because I think, well, what's this person's perspective on listeria? Can you review that for us? Well, not only will listeria survive at refrigeration temperatures, it can grow slowly at refrigeration temperatures. That's one of the unique attributes of listeria. It has such a wide temperature range. It can grow all the way to down to from 32 uh, Fahrenheit or zero centigrade up to uh, 45 centigrade. So it has a wi- very wide temperature range. So uh, you, listeria is especially unique because it cycles between being a saprophyte and a pathogen. So it does equally well in a uh, where there's food and there's something not living, it's just uh, dead organic material. And it does equally well when it infects a host and causes disease. So it's one of the hallmarks of listeria, and uh, it's very good at what it does. And probably we have selected for these specific strains that now colonize food processing plants. So listeria evolves like all bacteria, and they've probably adapted to these food processing plants. 
we think there's two classes of listeria. One are animal adapted that are kind of on the farm. And then there's ones that are more food adapted and adapted to humans also. So we, we think where there, there might be two classes of listeria monocytogenes. And the, the ones that are animal adapted only cause problems when there's cross-contamination from the raw to the cooked. But when it comes to these ones that are adapted to the food processing plants, they're contaminating the food directly from those environments in the food processing plant. So it's not really cross-contamination because they've colonized these post-pasteurization uh, processing areas. And if you're going to spend money in your sanitation, that's where you should spend it, on the post-pasteurization processing part. I don't worry so much about the raw part because that's always going to have pathogens. But what you don't want is after you've cooked the product and you've destroyed the the, the vegetative pathogens, you don't want to get any recontamination. So, Especially on food contact surfaces because bacteria are essentially hitchhikers. So you really have to think about where is there potential for uh, contact contamination. I mentioned before that slicer that was contaminated in the Canadian outbreak, but I think there's many similar type examples where people just didn't realize there was that crevice or that hole or that compartment that wasn't being regularly cleaned and sanitized. And it's before you get into that problem, you can buy equipment that doesn't have these harborage sites. That's probably, that's even better if you can do that. Unfortunately, I think there's not so many engineers that are thinking this way when they design these pieces of equipment. They're thinking about speed and volume rather than, boy, I've just created a piece of equipment that has these harborage sites, you know. Well, Dr. Cannabell, you raise a fascinating issue for food sanitation managers and their use of sterilants and chemicals. In your previous comments, you said that in the transmission, they actually transmit different DNA signals so that they can survive. And we talked about MRSA or an organism which is a staph organism which has become resistant to traditional antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Are these organisms so re resistant that sanitation managers need to switch the chemicals every once in a while? I think th it depends on the type of sanitizer. I think some sanitizers are so general it doesn't make any difference, like chlorine-based, because they'll attack so many the chlorine attacks so many different sites in the bacteria that they can't become resistant to it. Uh, other types of uh, sanitizers that are more specific in their targets, uh, that could be the case. So the sanitizers are not the same thing as antibiotics. You know, Antibiotics are exquisitely specific usually. Sanitizers are much more general. So <clears throat> um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, I think the main you. thing in cleaning and sanitizing is the cleaning part. That's what people don't realize. Because if you don't, if you can't clean it, you can't sanitize it. So you have to ask yourself: Do you have a surface that's cleanable? This is absolutely the most important point. Because if your equipment is not cleanable, I don't care what sanitizer you throw at it; it's not going to sanitize it. So more emphasis needs to be placed on the type of equipment that's manufactured, is it cleanable? And am I using the correct procedure to clean it? Because what really cleaning is going to remove 99% of all the food and the bacteria. And the purpose of the sanitizer is just to kill the few remaining cells that might be present. You know, So I think more emphasis on the cleaning and the cleanability of equipment would go a long way to eliminating these harborage sites and making your sanitizer effective, no matter what sanitizer you use. Dr. Cannabell, that is an excellent focus for a food sanitation manager that is working in a plant that's older 
and they can't replace all their equipment or their process, but they can look at their entire process in a HACCP mentality and look for those harborage sites and then engage, as you said, in the 99% cleaning. Yeah, and especially focus on the food contact surfaces. Maybe you can't change everything in the plant, but maybe you can change something on the food contact surface. We I remember we had a problem one time when we had these fingers that were in a hot dog collator, and they were like belting material. And we just could not, no matter what we did, we could not sanitize those fibrous fingers. So I lobbied for changing them to a solid plastic, and when we did that, the problem disappeared overnight. So, you know, focus first on the food contact surfaces. If you can, you know, get those so that you... You've eliminated the hybrid sites. You will have went a long way to preventing problems. That's an excellent point, and I raise as a collaborative discussion point. The FDA recently did an outbreak investigation. They took 50 environmental swabs and came up with, I think, seven contact surfaces that had been contaminated with a foodborne pathogen. So mm-hmm. not all the surfaces in a plant will be contaminated, but those particular right. sites. This, the same exact thing happened in the cantaloupe outbreak. When, CD, when FDA sampled the field and the processing plant, they could not find the outbreak strains of listeria in the field. Where they found them was on the food contact surfaces in the processing plant, and that's where the contamination happened. So a lot of people want to kind of sample in the wrong areas, I think. You know, you have to realize it's the food contact surfaces that are so critical. Well, Dr. Cannabell, I really and genuinely appreciate your time. We've kept you much longer than I originally anticipated, but I genuinely appreciate you and your expertise in your research that's groundbreaking, and I'd like to allow you to conclude your remarks with a closing statement. Well, I just hope what I presented uh, can be used by food processors and commercial testing laboratories to, again, and maybe even government laboratories, to prevent foodborne illness. I think we all need to work together for that goal. Excellent. Again, I'd like to close by thanking you and invite you back when your research further flowers into more information that food production managers can use in their daily operations, and particularly when they have an outbreak or in their prevention strategies. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And wish you a great day. Thanks. Same to you, Mandy. Bye now. Bye-bye.